Good morning and welcome to morning worship from St Peter's Church, Ipsley. My name is Linda Nicholas and I'm part of the ministry team at St Peter's and it's really great to catch up with you this morning and share worship with you. O oh Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Blessed are you, creator of all things. The heavens adore you. Let the whole earth worship you. Let all peoples proclaim you. Let us serve you in love and in peace. Come, Lord, and rule. Come into our hearts and fill them with love. Come, Lord, and rule. Come into our minds and fill them with peace. Come, Lord, and rule. Come into our lives and fill them with light. Come, Lord, and rule. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in this new day, so may the light of your presence, O oh God, set our hearts on fire for you, now and forever. Amen. Today is the day that the Church of England remembers Joachim and Anne. Joachim and Anne were considered to be the parents of Jesus's mother, Mary. There is no historical evidence, however, um, or any elements of their lives and any stories about Mary's father and mother come to us through legend and tradition. The stories that people told about them that were remembered down through the ages. It is believed that they were respected members of the Jewish community and the oldest story comes from a document called the Gospel of James, although in no way should be this document be trusted to be factual, historical or a word of God. The legend told in this document that after years of childlessness, an angel appeared to tell Anne and Joachim that they would have a child. And months later, Mary was born. Now we do, however, know that Mary was to play an important part in God's loving plan for the world. And so the Church of England celebrate their joint feast on this day, the 26th of July, for their love of one another and for Mary. And it's an example of how God calls us to live. They also remind us to honour our own grandparents and to thank them for blessings that they pass down to us in love. And Anne, among many other things, is the patron saint of grandmothers and Joachim of grandfathers. And the special collect for today. Lord of Israel, who bestowed such grace on Anne and Joachim that their daughter Mary grew up obedient to your word and made ready to be the mother of your son. Help us to commit ourselves in all things to your keeping and grant us the salvation you promised to your people through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. So the psalm appointed for today is Psalm 119. And we're going to read verses 105 to 144. So it is rather a long psalm. So if you can follow along with me, that would be really good. 
So we're Psalm 119, verses 105 to 144. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept, Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. I hate double-minded people, but I love your law. You are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. Away from me, you evildoers, that I may keep the commands of my God. Sustain me, my God, according to your promise, and I shall live. Do not let my hopes be dashed. Uphold me, and I shall be delivered. I shall always have regard for your decrees. You reject all who stray from your decrees, for their delusions come to nothing. All the wicked of the earth you discard like dross. Therefore, I love your statutes. My flesh trembles in fear of you. I stand in awe of your laws. I have done what is righteous and just. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Ensure your servants' well-being. Do not let the arrogant oppress me. My eyes fail, looking for your salvation, looking for your righteous promise. Deal with your servant according to your love and teach me your decrees. I am your servant. Give me discernment that I may understand your statutes. It is time for you to act, Lord. Your law is being broken. Because I love your commands more than gold, more than pure gold, and because I consider all your precepts right, I hate every wrong path. Your statutes are wonderful, therefore I obey them. The unfolding of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant longing for your commands. Turn to me and have mercy on me, as you always do to those who love your name. Direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. Redeem me from human oppression that I may obey your precepts. Make your face shine on your servant and teach me your decrees. Streams of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not obeyed. You are righteous, Lord, and your laws are right. The statues you have laid down are righteous. They are fully trustworthy. My zeal wears me out, for my enemies ignore your words. Your promises have been thoroughly tested, and your servant loves them. Though I am lowly and despised, I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is everlasting, and your law is true. Trouble and distress have come upon me. But your commands give me delight. Your statutes are always righteous. Give me understanding that I may live. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever.
Well, Psalm 119 is the longest psalm in the Bible. And we just read a small portion of it today. And almost every verse mentions God's word. Such repetition was common in Hebrew culture. People did not have personal copies of scriptures like we do today. So God's people memorized his word and passed it along by word of mouth. So the word was passed down through the generations. The structure of this psalm allows for easy memorization, helping us to remember that God's word, the Bible, along with the help and guidance of his Holy Spirit, is the only sure guide for living a God-honoring life. In verse 105, the psalmist states, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Now, if we were to go out into the woods at night, it would be very dark and it would be very difficult to see anything. Even if we have a flashlight, we may only be able, we may not be able to see the whole path, but just a little bit in front of us. But it would be enough just to be able to see, to place a step. And likewise, God's word lights our path as we walk through the darkness of this world, one step at a time. To walk safely in the woods at night, we need a light for protection so that we don't trip over tree roots or fall into holes. In this life, we walk through a dark forest of evil. But the Bible can be our light to show us the way ahead so we don't stumble as we walk. It reveals the entangling roots of thoughts, values and attitudes. We need a light to reach our desired destination so that we will be able to see our way clearly enough to stay on the right path. With God's light before him, the psalmist confesses, I have sworn and confirmed that I will keep your righteous judgments. His language sounds very legal, doesn't it? And very emphatic. He's saying that he will uphold the law of God as it applies to the situations of his life. His ethics are rather, his ethics are absolute rather than relative. They are not determined by the particular context in which he finds himself. We read that the psalmist has suffered much. Trouble and distress have come upon him. The wicked have set snares for him. He was quite possibly persecuted. He now asks the Lord to revive him. Pres preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. He laments that he constantly takes his life in his hands and is always at risk, but he does not forget God's laws. God's laws sustain him through the fears and trials of his life. And we can read too in Job 20 verse 10, in his hand, that's the Lord, in his hand is the life of every creature and breath of all mankind. God renews his spirit. And even though we still face oppression, he remains faithful to God's word as he states. But I have not strayed. I've not wandered from your precepts. So the psalmist is still facing oppression, but He's trying not to wander from God's precepts. The word of God is our light. In it, we come to know God. In it, we come to know his will for us. Through it, we have strength to stand against our enemies and endure persecution in our lives. This is our eternal heritage. The book is open. It is before us. We must not miss it. The lighted path is 
not ever whatever we want it to be, but righteous judgment and God's precepts. On such a path, there is no danger or trap, but a heritage of joy. Thus, the guidance of the Lord's instruction enables us to negotiate right and wrong and walk on the right and lighted path for all occasions. The second Bible reading this morning is 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 13. Warning from Israel's history. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptised into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our heart on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, in this passage, Paul includes a rather strange and bizarre retelling of Israel's exodus to illustrate for the Corinthians their own precarious position as a church living in a wilderness time. A limbo of sorts between their newfound freedom in Christ and the weighted fruition of God's kingdom. In this period of waiting, Paul urges the Flandering Church to learn from the mistakes of their ancestors and to be faithful to the jealous God of Israel. The wilderness illustration comes due to Paul's larger argument regarding eating food that had been sacrificed to idols. In 1 Corinthians 8, Paul attempts to reframe the thinking of those who feel as though they have the freedom to eat idol food, even to the precepts of the local tem temple. Paul is far less concerned about the food itself than he is about the possibility of some in the church going back to a life of idolatry. Verse 7, do not be idolaters as some of them were. Paul has no qualms at all about offending folks with an offensive message. Rather, Paul is concerned that so many turn away from faith, going back to honouring other gods. 
leading to their destruction. Hence, Paul likens the Corinth church to the Israelites in their exodus from Egypt and their wilderness wanderings. Paul urges the Corinthians to learn from their mistakes and to learn from the mistakes of their ancestors in particular and their unfaithfulness during the wilderness wanderings. It is often noted that the behaviours explicitly described in verse 6 to 10 in today's passage are behaviours with which the Corinthians struggle, particularly sexual immorality and grumbling. It is interesting to note, though, whether the Israelites are grumbling, intermarrying or committing acts of sexual immorality, the charges against Israel are typically framed as a failure to the faithful God. And we see examples in Numbers 21 and Numbers 25, Psalms 78 and 106. And Paul views the dilemma of eating idle food as not only singing, sinning against community, but as sinning against Christ. And you can read a bit more of that in the following verses, 14 to 33. Paul hopes that the church will learn from scripture and Paul's retelling contrasts the unfaithfulness of the ancestors with the faithfulness of God. And the Corinthians can learn from scripture that they've been called by a jealous God. They should avoid idolatry and should avoid causing others in the community to go back to their former idolatrous lives. Like their ancestors in the faith, the predominantly gentle Corinthian church is called to live in a manner that is faithful to the one who is the very source of their life and existence. Living faithfully to this God includes considering one's witness to others for whom also Christ has died. The warnings are there. We may think that we are standing strong and standing firm, but be careful that we're not tempted into doing things that is common to all mankind. Temptation is a routine part of life. Our desire to sin can sometimes feel so much more powerful than our desire to do what is right before God. What if we cannot resist? In response to that kind of fear, the Bible offers reassurance that our God is still there for us. He loves us and he's not waiting for us to fail. He is ready to help us when we think we might fail. And Paul adds to the promise that God will always make a way of escape out of whatever temptation stands before us. If we look for a way to say no to whatever sin compels us, God promises we will find it. In some cases, we might, lit might mean literally escaping from a situation, actually running away from a situation as Joseph ran away from his master's wife in Genesis 39. So sometimes we can literally be escaping. God is actively working to help those who are in Christ, who want to do what is right, to be successful in resisting temptation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, who understands what it is like to be tempted in life. Thank you that he is able to sympathise with all our weaknesses. Thank you that there is no temptation that we have to face that is not common to the human race. And thank you that you have promised to provide a way of helping us resist by grace through faith in Christ when trials come to us in any way. Amen.
And we now come to a time of prayer. God of our past and of the future, we bring to you in prayer those people and places on our hearts today. We remember the parts of the world where people are being murdered, oppressed and displaced. We pray especially for the people of countries continually at war, for the people of countries who are divided and sporadic conflicts flare up all the time. May those in power leave behind violence and follow your call to peace. We pray for those countries affected by flooding, and we think of the people of Germany, those in Henan province in China, where there has been significant loss of life and damage to property. Lord, we pray that you help them rebuild their homes and their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We are asked by the diocese today to pray for Worcestershire County Council, for the councillors who are part of Worcestershire County Council, including council leader Simon Geraghty, and for the staff who support them. We pray that the decisions they make will benefit those most in need across Worcestershire. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church and especially for the diocese. Almighty God, source of our hope and all good things, you call us in love to share in the work of creation and making all things new. Bless our diocese, the Diocese of Worcestershire. Uphold our bishops, John and Graham. Inspire them, Lord, by the power of your spirit as they lead us forward. We pray for all the churches in Redditch and their congregations. May we all be faithful in our worship, confident in our discipleship and joyful in our service that through us the world may catch a glimpse of the love you have for each of us, made known to us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A prayer for those who are in pain and suffering. Oh dear Lord Jesus, please be in the hearts and lives of all those who suffer. Bring healing to those who are enduring pain. Bring value to those who are disregarded. Bring joy to those in great sorrow. Bring hope to those who feel that they have nothing to live for. Bring comfort to those who mourn. We uphold to you all those who are mentioned in the weekly catch who need your help. Those known to us personally. And all those with no one to pray for them. In accordance with your will, we pray that you heal all people who suffer. Give them hope and comfort that comes from your spirit. Fix their eyes on the hope that one glorious day Jesus will return and all will be made right with us and in the world. And we ask all these things by your spirit and in your holy name. Amen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we say together the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. May the Lord show us mercy. May the Lord grant us peace. May the Lord bring us joy and the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Let us go in the light and peace of Christ. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you for joining with me this morning, and I look forward to joining with you again tomorrow when the Bible readings will be Psalm 1 to 1 and 1 Corinthians 11, 2 to 16, which I found to be a very difficult passage. <laughs>